Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to this next lesson in Physical Science. I hope you've had an awesome day and that you're ready to do some more vertical projectile motion. So in this lesson, we're going to be going through some vertical projectile exam questions. And then when we finish that, we're going to work, move on to work, energy, and power. I'm not sure if we're going to get there. We'll see how we do. Um, but let's go through it. So what I've done is I've the whole point about these lessons is to make sure you guys are as well prepared for the exams as possible. So I've included a whole bunch of old exam paper questions and we're going to go through those, okay? So that is the plan for today and then we'll see how far we get. So it says ball A is thrown vertically downwards. So it's thrown vertically downwards from the top of building, which is 80 meters high at a velocity of 12 meters per second. So it's not dropped, it's thrown, right? At the same instant, a second identical ball B, so it's got the same mass, same size, everything, is thrown upwards at a velocity of 30 meters per second. Ball A and ball B pass each other after 2.135 seconds, 2.135 seconds. It says ignore all effects of air friction. Okay. So I know that we started this yesterday and I've decided I wanted to go through it again because I wasn't happy with um, the fact that you may have struggled a bit on certain sections. So I've decided to do it again and make sure you can understand everything. So first of all, it says give the direction of the acceleration of ball B while moving upwards. Okay, well, the acceleration, the only force acting on ball B, if we ignore the air friction, and it does say ignore air friction over here, it says the only force acting on it is the force of gravity, and the force of gravity is always downwards towards the earth, so therefore the direction of the acceleration of ball B is going to be downwards. So acceleration, uh, direction of acceleration up or B is always going to be downwards, whether we are traveling up or not. Okay, next. It says, calculate the velocity of ball B the moment it passes ball A. So they want to know the velocity of B, the velocity of B as it passes ball A. So there's a point here where this is A and this is B where they are going to pass. Now, the cool thing about this is that we know that when they pass, they both travel 2,135 seconds. Okay, 2,135 seconds. So do you agree we can work out how far B has traveled at that time, but we can also work out the velocity, which is what they've asked. So let us write down the information we have. We have the initial velocity of B, and we need to decide if it, which direction is positive or negative. Um, so why don't we choose up as positive, just because we can. Okay, so if we do that, we've got an initial velocity up of 30 meters per second. The final velocity is what we're trying to find out. The acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity, which is negative because it's downwards, it's minus 9,8. And the time taken is 2,135 seconds. Okay, so do you agree we can use the equation Vf is equal to Vi? plus A delta T to work out the final velocity, which is the velocity of the ball B at the moment it passes ball A. So we can say that is equal to 30 plus minus 9,8 times 2,135. So we can pop that in our calculator. And we've got, mm, switch it on, on. We've got 30 plus bracket minus 9.8 bracket bracket 2.135 close bracket equals and we get 9,077 which is 9,08 so that's 9,08 meters per second and they have asked for the velocity so you have to give a direction, so we need to say upwards. Okay, so that is the final velocity of B as they pass each other. Right, now they say calculate the distance between ball A 
and will be 2.5 seconds after it was projected. And this is as far as we got in the question yesterday. So we've just really repeated a little bit of it, so now we're going to carry on. So we want to know what is the distance between ball B and ball A after it was and 2.5 seconds after it's projected. So what we really need to do is do this in two steps. The first thing we're going to do is see how far ball A has traveled in that 2.5 seconds. Okay, so let's do that. So the initial velocity of ball A, so we chose up as positive. So now we're keeping to that, which means that the initial velocity of A is going to be minus 12. Its acceleration is still minus 9, 8 because it's traveling downwards. The time it took is 2, 5. Okay. And what else? And we want delta x. Okay. So do you agree our equations are Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T? Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2A delta x. We've got delta x is equal to Vi delta t plus a half A delta t squared. And then we've got delta x is equal to Vf plus Vi over 2 delta t. And we don't have the final velocity, so therefore we're going to be using this equation here. So we can say delta x is equal to the initial velocity, which is minus 12, times by the time of 2 comma 5, and then goes plus a half, times by the acceleration of minus 9 comma 8, times by the time of 2 comma 5 squared. So if we pop this into our calculator, what can we get? We've got 12, okay, let's do it properly. We've got minus 12 times 2.5 equals plus bracket 0 0.5 times negative 9.8 times 2.5 squared close bracket equals and the answer is minus 60.63. So delta x is minus 60 comma 63 meters, which means A has traveled downwards of 60.63 meters. Okay, does everybody understand that? That's what A is, right? Now we need to find out where B is. So we need to find the displacement of B. And you need to understand that B could have gone up and come down already in that 2.5 seconds, or it could have come up and gone part of the way. So we need to find its displacement. Okay. So let's do B. So let's change the color. So we're going to do B. So the initial velocity of B is still 30. The acceleration is still minus 9, 8. Okay. We don't know the final velocity and we don't care, but we're trying to work out delta X. And the delta T is again 2, 5 because it's the same there. So do you agree we can use exactly the same equation? We can go delta X is equal to 30 times by 2 comma 5 plus a half times minus 9.8 times by 2 comma 5 all squared. So we're going to pop that in our calculator and we're going to say okay fine we've got to clear it. 30 times 2 comma 5 equals plus bracket 0, 0,5 times negative 9.8 times 2, 5 squared close bracket equals and that is 44.375 so that's 44,375 which is 44,38 meters Interesting. So what's happened is that A has traveled down 60.63 meters and B has traveled up 44,38 meters. Okay. So do you agree that A is about 19 meters above the ground 
and B is now 44.38 meters above the ground, right? So do you agree we could say, let's work out how that much that is. We're going to say that A, let's go back to blue, A is going to be 80 minus 60.63 meters above the ground. So let's work out what that is. We're going to use our calculator. We're going to go 80 minus 60.63 and that is 19.37. So that is 19 comma 37 meters, okay? So A is 19.37 meters above the ground. B is 44.38 meters above the ground. So what is the distance between them? The distance is 44.38 minus 19 comma 37. So that is a one, a zero. 14 minus nine makes a five. And three minus one is a two. So that's 25.01 meters. Okay, so that was kind of a nice question because you had to realize that this A was traveling this way down and it was that far, how far it traveled, not how far it was from the ground. So therefore you had to work that out. And then B, you had to work out how far it had traveled and then subtract the two. Nice question. Now it says, Sketch a velocity a position versus time graph for the motion of ball A till it reaches the ground, as well as the motion of ball B until it passes ball A. U is the ground to zero. Okay. So the reason I'm not erasing everything is because I actually want to draw it here and I need some of the information we've already worked out. So I'm just going to erase the stuff I don't need so that I can draw this. And we're drawing a position versus time graph, a position versus time graph. And we are using, we are using ground as a zero position. Okay, so we can do that. Let me just get colored pen out. Okay, so position versus time graph is one of the easier ones to draw because you really are just showing exactly what happened. So it's going to be delta Y in meters or delta X, it doesn't matter. And this is change in time in seconds. And we're using the ground as reference, which is great because then you're showing exactly what is happening. So it says sketch a position time graph for the motion of the ball till it reaches the ground as well as for the motion of ball B until it passes A. Use the ground is zero. It clearly indicates the time at which the balls pass each other. So we know the balls pass each other at 2.135 seconds. So over here somewhere, they pass each other, right? Do you agree that at 2.5 seconds, they haven't quite reached the ground? So somewhere over here, this year is 2.135 seconds. Okay, that's 2.135. So, and over here is about 20. Okay, but it is accelerating. So, basically, we could say that this is going to be A. That is going to be the motion of A. Why? Because it starts off slow, but because of acceleration, it speeds up and it hits the ground here. And we don't know what time it hits the ground because we haven't worked it out. And this is clearly indicates the time which the balls pass each other. So, there we go. Right, now, if they pass each other, they have the same position at the same time. So B is also going to be at that point, right? But B is doing what? It's slowing down. So, and because B, yeah, B is actually going to go higher than position A. But it says, hang on. Use, okay, it says till it reaches the ground as well as for the motion P until it passes B. So all that we're going to do is do this with B. Okay, and there we're going to go. Because that has to, there can't be a straight line. So if it looks like a straight line in my diagram, let me raise it and do it more like a parabola. It's supposed to look like a parabola because of the fact that it is slowing down because of the force of gravity. So that is supposed to look like 
a parabola and I'm sorry that my lines are terrible. Please make sure that you do better lines than I do. Okay, and that's it. That's all you had to draw. The whole point about this was to show that A was coming from the position of 80 meters and it was dropping down and just speeding up so the gradient had to get steeper. And you needed to show that this one was going from a position of zero and that the gradient was slowing down. That's a better one actually. Um, but don't do what I just did. Okay, rather erase it all and then, not all, all, <laughs> rather erase it all and then redraw it neatly. Don't sketch, okay, so it needs to look something like that, so it's slowing down. Okay, and that's basically what it's supposed to look like. And then obviously you guys need to give labels to X and Y axes and then you need a heading. You always need a heading. So it would be displacement or position. Position versus time graph. Position versus time graph. There you go. Right, let's do this question. It says the graph below shows the motion of a brick that is thrown vertically upwards from the ground. So it's thrown vertically upwards. It takes 1.4 seconds to reach the highest point, after which it falls downwards. Okay, and is caught by a person on a scaffold building, building a wall of the house. Okay, so there's some dude here who is standing on a scaffold next to a house. And that's why he catches it. Okay, it says ignore the effects of friction. Right, now it says, what does position Y1 represent on the graph? Well, do you agree that Y1 represents the height at which the guy caught the ball? I mean, caught the brick, okay? Because yeah, it's the same height as that. So Y1 is the height at which the guy hit, caught the brick. Okay, now it says write down the value of the time Tx without performing any without performing any calculation. Okay, so if we look at this immediately, we think, oh my word, we can't do this because we don't have any numbers, but we actually do if we read the graph. Do you see that what goes up must come down because the only force acting on it is the force of gravity? And it passed this point, which is the height at which the guy was going to catch it at 0.6 seconds going up. Then it went up and then it's coming down. And the time it takes to get from here to here, from that point to that point, has to be the same as it takes from there to get from there to there. It has to be the same amount of time because it's going through, through the same displacement and the only force acting on it is the force of gravity. So if it has to be the same time. Okay, so therefore we can say, well, this year, the difference between this is 0.8. Therefore, the distance the difference between that and time has to be 0 0.8 as well. So 1 comma 4 plus 0 comma 8 is 2 comma 2 seconds. So that time Tx is 2 comma 2 seconds. Right, now it says at which time will the velocity of the brick be zero? Okay, the only time the velocity of the brick is zero is up here. If you guys are telling me that because the guy caught it, over there, the velocity is zero. I'm going to be very, very upset because the, the velocity of the brick was zero when the guy caught it. Effectively, the brick would be hovering and he would stick out his hand and grab it as it hovers in the air. That's not, we don't believe, we don't live in a science fiction world, okay? These bricks don't hover, okay? It is actually coming down with quite a hectic velocity down here and he has to catch it. The only place where the velocity of this brick is zero is over here. Why? Because if you want to think of it this way, the gradient which equals delta x over delta t, which equals the velocity, equals zero. This point here is the turning point, and at that point, instantaneously, for a very short period of time, the velocity of the brick is zero. Now it says calculate the initial velocity of the brick. Okay, okay. So we know that that height there is 9.6 meters. And we've got that the final velocity is zero and we know the time it took to get there, right? 
So do you agree that we can say the final velocity for just this motion here, the final velocity is zero. The acceleration is minus 9,8 because it's acceleration due to gravity, because they said ignore the effect of friction. We have that delta x or delta y is 9,6. We have the time is 1,4 and they want the initial velocity. Okay, so we can use a whole bunch of equations, any of them, to really get the initial velocity. So we can use Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T. So the initial velocity we don't know, the final velocity is zero, but the acceleration is minus 9,8 and the time it took to get to this point was 1,4. Therefore we can say that Vi is equal to, and we can get out our calculator, and we can say it's 9.8 times 1.4, which equals 13,72. So it's 13,72 meters per second upwards. They didn't ask for the magnitude. You have to give the direction. And that is 13,72 meters per second upwards. Okay, now it says calculate the magnitude of the position Y1. They want to know what is that, how high is that? Okay, so now that shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, let's think about it. We've got the initial velocity is now 13,72, right? Our final velocity is the final velocity at Y1. We don't know. That's what we're trying to find out. But our acceleration is minus 9,8, okay, from here to here. We know the time is naught comma, actually, sorry, we don't want final velocity, we want displacement, is naught comma 6, and we want delta x. We want delta x. Okay, we don't have the VF anyway. So let's think about this. What equations could we possibly use? Our equations are VF is equal to VI plus A delta T. VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. Um, delta X is equal to VI delta T plus a half AT squared, delta T squared. And delta X is equal to VF plus VI over 2 delta T. So we want delta x, so it's not going to be that equation. We don't have vf, so it's not that equation, and it's not that equation. Ta-da! It's that, okay, grade 12s, obviously there are going to be times when we need to use a combination of equations, but in this case we've been lucky, and we can use one equation to get our answer. And I'm going to write it over here because this is a bit cramped. So we're going to go delta x is equal to the initial velocity, and we're choosing up as positive, in case you hadn't realized, we're choosing up as positive. So it's going to be 13,72 times by the change in time, which is 0,6, plus a half times acceleration due to gravity, which is minus 9,8, times 0,6 all squared. So let's pop that in our calculator. So we're going to clear it and we're going to go 13.72 times by 0 0.6 equals plus bracket 0, 0,5 times negative 9.8 times 0 0.6 squared close bracket equals and that becomes 6.47. Remember, remember, we always run off to six, two decimal places. So that's 6.47. So delta X is 6,47 meters. And they just want the magnitude. So that is 6,47. Hmm, that's quite nice. Finally, it says sketch an acceleration versus time graph for the motion of the brick. <laughs> and this is a little bit of a trick question. 
What is the only force acting on this block? The only force acting on this block is the force of gravity, right? And which way does the force of gravity act? Force of gravity acts downwards, and what did we choose as positive? We chose upwards as positive. And the acceleration due to gravity is a constant minus 9.8. So, let me write acceleration in meters per second squared, time in seconds, acceleration versus time. You will write it out perfectly, all the whole world, not just like that. And your graph is going to look like that. It's supposed to be a straight line, so you use a ruler. And it's supposed to be parallel to that, so use a ruler, and it's sitting at minus 9,8. And that's it. It does not matter that the brick is going up and down and sideways and across and jiggly and whatever. The only force acting on it is the force of gravity, and the force of gravity is down. So therefore, the only acceleration on this brick is always, always negative 9.8 during this motion. Okay. Right, now half past six or 6.25, we've got some time. So what I want to do is I'm going to start going through the section which is called Work, Energy and Power. And Work, Energy and Power is a very important section. Um, it's quite a large section in the final exam. So we're going to go through it. We're going to go through it nice and carefully. And then we're again going to do numerous examples of work, energy and power. And then what we're going to do is we've already taught you a bit about momentum. And momentum and work and energy come in hand in hand in some questions as well. So then we're going to do a combination of questions. We're going to do com questions that include momentum and work and energy. Right, but that's like long term. But let's start off by talking about work. Now, when we talk about work, we're not talking about sitting behind a desk, studying your science, or your maths, or your English, or your Afrikaans, whatever subjects you have, and doing work. Okay, we're not talking about that. We're talking about work as defined by physics. And that is states that work is done when a force acts on an object and the object moves in the direction of the force. So it seems like a very easy de definition, and it is a very easy definition, by the way, this is the definition you need to learn. But what's important is that these three things have to happen in order for their work to be done. First of all, there has to be a resultant force. It actually has to be F res, a resultant force that acts on the object, okay? The object has to move and it has to move in the direction of the force. And only then, then and only then, is work being done on the object. So, the definition, the official definition that you have to learn and study and be able to say in your sleep, if someone had to phone you at three o'clock in the morning, for example, and ask you for the definition of work, because they had nothing else to do with their lives, would be work done on an object by a constant force F is defined as F delta X cos theta, where F is the magnitude of the force, delta X is the magnitude of the displacement, and theta is the angle between the force and the displacement, between the force and the displacement. Okay, so what happened was that many moons ago, the equation for work done used to be delta W is equal to F delta X. Okay, in fact, it used to be FD, but then they changed that to delta X. And everybody was very happy. Everybody understood that that was work is equal to force times delta X. And then suddenly you got questions where the force was at an angle of theta. And then the department decided in their wisdom that not everybody would be able to realize that only this component of the force actually made the object move forward. So what they did is to try and make it a little bit easier for the students is that they changed this definition to be W is equal to F delta X cos theta. And the reason they did this is because this bit here let's just work out what that is. That is the horizontal component, right? And this would be F. 
And if you looked at Sarkatoa, do you agree that's the adjacent side and that's the hypotenuse? So we'd go cos of theta is equal to the adjacent, which is the force horizontal over the hypotenuse, which is the actual force. Therefore, you'd say that FH is equal to F cos theta. And that's where that cos theta came from. F cos theta was, we're basically replacing the normal F. And then obviously you had the displacement over which the object moved. <laughs> okay, the problem with this, and this is my problem, and when we go through it, you'll understand why it's a problem, is that if you've got a block on a hill and you're pulling the block parallel to the surface, numerous of my students will assume that that theta is this theta, and it's not. This only comes into play when the force is not parallel with the surface. If the force is parallel with the surface, then theta equals zero because the angle is zero, okay? So that always worries me. So please understand that this cos theta is, look here, it says it's the angle between the force and the displacement. It has nothing to do with the angle of the slope. The slope doesn't come into it. Okay, it's the angle between the force and the displacement. Right, so next we need to point out that work is a scalar quantity, and that is very important. You can get negative work, but that's got to do with the fact that you're taking energy away from the system, not that it's in the opposite direction. The unit for work is joule or newton meter. It doesn't really matter. Joule, remember that work and energy are basically the same thing. Um, in order to do work, you need energy. And the reason we get newton meters makes sense because we've just said that W is equal to F delta X cos theta. Cos theta is just a number. F, the unit is newtons, and delta X is meters, so there you go. So the unit for work is either joules or newton meters. So when is no work done? Okay, we just said that work is done when you have a net force acting on something and it moves, and it moves in the direction of the force. Okay, so when is no work done? If the force is applied to the object, but the object does not move, then no work is done on the object. So this person here is pushing, pushing this boulder, and if the boulder does not move, then the person, no matter how hard they're pushing, it doesn't matter if they are sweating buckets and straining all their muscles and if they were like a big hulk he-man and they're going it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if this thing is not moving they are not doing any work okay if the object moves at a constant velocity across a frictionless surface there is no result in force and therefore there is no work. So we're saying that if it moves at a constant velocity across a frictionless surface, then basically there is no acceleration, right? And if there's no acceleration, there is no F res. And if there's no F res, there's no work done. Okay. So let's have a look at this little dude who's a waiter. Okay, the weight is doing work against the force of gravity. Agreed? Okay, he is holding his tray up against the force of gravity. However, he only does work when he picks the tray up or puts it down. He's now moving this tray horizontally as he walks. And because the force and the direction of the movement are not parallel to each other, he is not doing work. Remember what we said? We said there has to be a force. There has to be movement, and the movement has to be in the direction of the force. Okay, there has to be, the force has to be in the direction. Okay, so... If, for example, you guys are, I don't know, going to school 
and you've got a really heavy bag to pack. So you pick it up and you put it on your back. It's a backpack and you put it on your back. Do you agree that if you then walk horizontally, okay, you are doing no work? Okay, the only work you did was when you picked up the backpack and when you put it down. Similarly, if you're walking upstairs, okay, let's say you're walking up, I don't know, the Spanish stairs in Italy. I know it's kind of a misnomer, but there you go. Okay, there are hundreds of stairs, okay, and let's say you start over here, okay, and you walk up these stairs. It doesn't matter that there are 100,000 stairs. The only work that you're doing is in this direction and over that distance. And why is that? That is because the only force that you're working against is the force of gravity. So therefore, if you look at the equation, it says F net is equal to, or sorry, work done, is equal to F delta X cos theta. And the delta hex has to be in the direction of the force. And the only force acting on you as you walk up the stairs is the force of gravity. So therefore your delta x is going to be this distance here. Okay, right, so that's very important. Right, so let's look at an example. It says, determine the work done by the boy as he pulls the child. So you've got a force here of 50 newtons and it's at an angle of 30 degrees and he's moving it 30 meters to the right. So we know that F delta X cos theta. Okay, so this equation makes this sum really easy to do because what is it going to be? It's going to be F, which is 50 newtons, times by the displacement, which is 30, and then we just have to go cos 30 degrees. So then we just pop this in our calculator and we go, okay, fine, that's 50, there's a second, 50 times 30 times cos of 30, close bracket, equals 1299.04. 1299.04, 1299,04, and it's joules. That's how much work he's doing. But now I actually want to show you exactly what's happening here. Do you understand that when he's pulling this at this angle, he's doing two things. The one thing that he's doing is he's pulling the horizontal component of his force, is pulling the, what is this, trolley trailer, whatever, it's pulling it to the right. The other part, the vertical part, is pulling it upwards, okay? And the reason I'm showing you is just again to reinforce where this F cos theta comes from. We want this component here because remember we said that work done is equal to F net delta X, don't worry about the cos theta, if this is in the direction if the delta x is in the direction of the force, okay? This is the direction of the movement, so therefore we're looking at that force there, and what is the work done by that force? So if you look at that right angle triangle, you know that this is the adjacent side, and this is the hypotenuse, so therefore we can say sarcotoa, so the adjacent side is what we want, and we've got the hypotenuse, so we're going to use cos. So we're going to go cos of 30 degrees equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse of F. Therefore, the adjacent side is equal to F cos 30 degrees. And that's where this comes from, because that F is 50, so that's 50 cos 30 degrees. So that is basically covering, this bit here, is covering the fact that this is at an angle and this is the horizontal component. And then we're just multiplying it by the displacement of 30 meters to get the amount of work done. Right, now it says, we have a 25 kilogram crate of chocolate. Sure, it's a lot of chocolate. It's sitting on a loading dock. It needs to be pulled 10 meters to the store. So it needs to be pulled 
10 meters to the store. The coefficient of the kinetic friction between the box and the sidewalk is 0, 0,22. So mu k is 0, 0,22, right? What is the net work done on the crater if the man pulls the box with a force of 60 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees? Okay. So there are two ways we can do this, and I'm going to do one way today, and then I think we're going to run out of time, so then I'll do the other way. So the way to do this is either find the F net, and then substitute that into W is equal to F net delta X, okay? Or the way to do it is to go W net, which is the sum of all the work done. And either will work. Either of these will work, okay? I'm going to do this one today, and tomorrow I will do this one, the sum of all the work done. So what we do first is we work out what the net force is that is acting on this object that will move it in the direction, and then we just multiply it by its displacement. So do you agree that F net equals the sum of all forces? So what do we have? We have the force forward, which is the force of the man, plus minus the force of friction. Okay. Um, and the force of the man, remember, is going to be the horizontal component of the 60. So we can say that that is equal to 60 cos 30 degrees. How nice is that? Why? Because we've just proven it. I've just shown you that this horizontal component is the same as 60 cos 30 minus the force of friction. But remember the force of friction is equal to mu k if normal. So this is going to be mu k which is 0, 0,22 times by the normal force which is going to be how heavy is this box? It's 25 gauges. 25 times by 9,8. So now we need to put this all in our calculator. So let's get our calculator out. And we're going to go, we're going to clear it. I'm going to go 60 cos 30 close bracket minus bracket 0, 0,22 multiplied by 25 multiple 25 multiplied by 9.8 close bracket equals minus 1,94 so it's negative 1,94 newtons okay and then we can say therefore the work done is going to be minus 1,94 times by the delta x, which is 10 meters, which is going to be minus 19,4 meters, I mean joules. Now, we said that work was a scalar, so how are we getting a negative? How is it that we are getting a negative? Okay, I want you to think about that, and I want you to come back tomorrow and tell me what the, what is it, well, think about it, and then tomorrow we'll discuss what the meaning of that negative is. Right, I hope you have a good evening, and I will see you tomorrow.